many thanks to President Van Genep, dear Jos. There are a lot of people to whom you can ask something and they will say yes quite easily. Uh, I'm very grateful that the Sosiris uh, Foundation, the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, and UNIAPAC are presenting me with the opportunity to, to share some ideas about ethics and finance in the presence of such a distinguished audience. I knew by looking at uh, the list of participants in the panel that uh, I would be in the company of former Minister of Finance, Ono Ruling, but I'm very glad also to salute your former Prime Minister. Very honored that you are here to listen to us. Ladies and gentlemen, honorable guests, I don't know about you, but pronouncing the word honorable always triggers my memory. For me, it brings to mind the unforgettable, ironic words in the third act of William Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, when Mark Antony says, so are they all, all honorable men. And today, ladies and gentlemen, rational is the new honorable. Bewildered by the crisis that struck the banking world, we're inclined to paraphrase Mark Antony's words and say, with a sense of amazement, so are they all, all rational men. Yes, men. Uh, considering that prudence is a feminine word, it is of course quite unfortunate that finance and politics still remain overwhelmingly masculine today, and unfortunately this audience as well, present company included. Anyway, we search our souls for the reasons, the reasons, of the financial debacle in 2007-2008, and we try to establish the circumstances of the crime scene. A financial sector getting all too separated from real economics, practically unrestrained leveraging, a multiplication of complicated derivative financial products, and an extremely deregulated environment with a lack of strong global and compliance-driven supervision. And we ask, what were they thinking? We interrogate ourselves and we ask, where did this tremendous irrationality come from? Why? Because we all like to see ourselves as rational. We insist on finding out the reasons for what went wrong, in order for us not to make the same mistake again and not see a repetition of the catastrophe. I will submit that in thinking this way, we are tackling the problem through a very particular lens, the lens of rationality. And by looking for reasons, it is modernity, with its compelling focus on goal instrument action that we invite on stage. In my remarks, I will suggest that we take some distance from rationality, at least in the way that modernity has been framing it in all of our minds. One century ago, Max Weber wrote that instrumental rationality, Zweckrationalität, was taking over as the highest form of rational conduct, and in his view, this was happening to the detriment of the three other ideal types of rationality. Rational action in relation to values, Wert Rationalität, effective and emotional action, and traditional action. So, do not worry, it is the last thing on my mind to plead for less rationality. I suppose that we are all proud to be the children of enlightenment. And current times ask uh, ask less and not more dogmatic thinking. But I am convinced that a less economized rationality will give us more than a hint for some authentically new directions. And that would be a rationality with a stronger focus on values, on emotions, and even on tradition, if you prefer, on the fruit of the shared human experience throughout history. After all, let us not forget that there is a very peculiar assumption at the core of the so-called rational choice theory that we all seem to embrace. 
It presumes that the behavior of rational agents simply consists of always seeking maximization in the pursuit of their own material wealth. It presumes that the act which is not motivated opportunistically is to be judged as irrational. That view is problematic. By the way, a large chunk of the recommendations to be found in the Gospel, think for example of Matthew's full day's wage for those who were only hired at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, they are downright irrational. Or could they be inspirational? Can they at least create a greater awareness that it is not only pure economics that accounts for all the choices of human beings? In the book, Not Just for the Money, Bruno Frey illustrates how narrow the rational choice paradigm is when it comes to human motivation. I must say, I have always found it somewhat puzzling that in economics and in politics, the frequently used concept moral hazard is not defined as the risk that the behavior of the strongest and richest towards the weakest and poorest would not be up to the highest moral standards. No, when economists or politicians speak about moral hazard, it is about making sure that nobody takes advantage of you. It is designed to guarantee that one's solidarity is sufficiently anchored in the old Roman saying, do ut des, I give in order for you to give back. And I know that the famous ethnologist uh, Marcel Mauss defined the gift as deeply rooted in a game of reciprocity, but I suggest that civilization enters a new phase when brackets are being put around this reciprocity. I give, or I refrain from taking advantage of you, not because you are able and willing to reciprocate, but because you, as a human being, are worth it. Now, when it comes to justice and ethical behavior, let us also avoid the mistake of rushing towards an artificial and all too absolute distinction between the mechanics of the so-called real economy versus those of the financial world. I'm not saying that the specificity of the financial crisis should not inspire us to develop specific remedies, but not if it is to entertain an illusion. The illusion that real economy is a balanced and fair process only corrupted by the exaggerations of financial excesses. It is too easy to just put finance on the guilty bench, forgetting that if there is a trial to be had, it is the whole of the economy that should be implicated. I give only three examples. It is true that free market still fails to create just market prices, which fully integrate the societal costs of externalities like pollution, loss of biodiversity, resources getting exhausted. That, ladies and gentlemen, is a problem of real economy. Second example, worldwide there is a huge asymmetry in the sharing of the economic value chain. Only one illustration. The strongest European country exports almost twice as much coffee as all African countries combined, both in volume and in value. That is a problem of real economy. Third example, the abuse of economic power through monopolies or oligopolies, the injustice and violence that go hand in hand with the current resources grab on this planet, even food speculation. All these plagues are also problems of real economy. And it is perhaps one of the paradoxes of today that it might be the financial world that could come up with some of the technical innovations that can help solving some of these real economy ethical problems. Think, for example, of uh, carbon credits. At Fair Trade Belgium, we used to call ourselves Max Havelaar. Now we've become <coughs> more English, we call ourselves Fair Trade. I liked Max Havelaar. I preferred the, the, the previous title. At Fair Trade Belgium, we're examining these instruments. Uh, 
uh, of carbon credits. And if we can prevent them from being used as an excuse or an alibi for further pollution and instead transform them into instruments guaranteeing fair funding for sustainable development, then they can indeed be part of the solution. In my mind, the financial sector would attract the brightest and most engaged young people of today if it would invest its efforts and creativity in developing new ideas to help tackle some of these challenges, since they are very often strongly related to problems of unfair pricing, resource curses, lack of public funding, credit crunches, etc. And what do these things have in common? They are all about finance and money. They deserve the attention of the brightest financial whiz kids, much more than all the time and intelligence spent to look for legal loopholes in regulations concerning derivatives and structured financial products of dubious added value. Ladies and gentlemen, before I took up elected politics, I had the honor to lead the public transport company in my hometown, Brussels. And at my arrival at the helm of this beautiful company with 6,000 employees, I asked the engineers what their job was. And they answered, well, making sure that uh, the buses, the tramway and the subway run smoothly, of course. I replied, don't you think it is about making sure that the people living and working in Brussels arrive at their destination? Huh. Their first reaction was, of course, yeah, but that's the same. It took a while before they saw that this change of perspective, putting people at the center of our sense of purpose, resulted in a set of very important consequences. Allow me to underscore my point with a quote of Pope Francis in his apostolic exhortation Gaudium Evangelii. Commenting on the devastating hardship that came about in the aftermath of the crisis, he wrote, One cause of this situation is found in our relationship with money, since we calmly accept its dominion over ourselves and our societies. The current financial crisis can make us overlook the fact that it originated in a profound human crisis, the denial of the primacy of the human person. Today, I think in finance and, and probably also in a very important part of economic activity in general, the sole sense of purpose for businesses still seems to be the maximization of return on equity. Do not get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with aspiring for a decent return on your investment. But it is genuinely sad if that is the only bottom line. The financial sector has an irreplaceable role to play in developing sound economies, especially, not exclusively, through intermediation, making sure that savings in parts of the economy are oriented towards sound investments elsewhere. Just to illustrate this, the lack of reliable credit is one of the main handicaps holding back developing countries. Access to credit and investment can be an, eng an engine for growth, lifting millions out of poverty in the developing world. So it is a noble vocation, and I do not hesitate to use that word, it is a noble vocation to be part of the redistribution of money and risks in the economy, so as to make sure that good ideas get proper funding, and that human progress can take its course. But once the banker loses sight of this sense of purpose and starts thinking that he or she is only in business to please stock markets, there is something profoundly missing. And mind you, these are not only issues that present themselves in retail banking, which gets most of the attention in the ethics debate because of its public exposure, but also, and I might say even more, in the wholesale and in the investment banking business. In the years leading up to the banking crisis, there was a quite generalized myopia, preventing people from seeing much further than the performance charts in the stock exchange. And the aggravating circumstance, of course, was a blatant short-termism. 
an obsession with quarterly results inspired by a very short-sighted incentive model, both for employees, executives and companies in general. And today? Well, sometimes I feel that only the rush to the short term has really been problematized and dealt with, at least to some degree, but that the rest of the model is still the same. Before I explain this, let me assure you that I am very much in favor of employee incentives, as long as they are transformed into instruments to encourage long-term and sustainable success. Yes, I am one of those rari nantes in politics who are absolutely not against bonuses. Yekosh, even for bankers. As long as they do effectively reward sound and long-term decisions. This implies either patience on behalf of the beneficiary in collecting his or her bonus, or some kind of clawback schedule, recuperating bonuses if the decisions turned out not to be so wise. I very much prefer the first approach, but I suppose the other one is considered to be a decent second best in our impatient times. But that is not my point. I believe that enlarging the horizon in time, albeit an important step, is not enough. The instrumentalization is still there. It is still about shareholders' value, which is not the same thing as values. I know that there is a strong thesis that ethical behavior is in the company's best interest, notably because of the reputational cost of unethical behavior, and that some would like to install ethics as an instrument of competition. This idea has given rise to what we might call, perhaps a little bit uh, disparagingly, an ethics industry, with consultants and coaches, courses and seminars, trying to prove that a company that takes ethics seriously stands a better chance of making nice profits as well. I'm not even saying that this is not true, perhaps even more often than on occasion. Uh, customers uh, and consumers have indeed become much more demanding and vigilant, and a negative NGO report can have an impressive detrimental impact on market shares. And no CEO can really afford to neglect the impact of ethical questions on the way his company is judged by his environment. Nor am I underestimating the enormous productivity gains that ethical standards and behavior can produce by diminishing the huge transaction costs of control and compliance administration. A lack of trust imposes a kind of tax on all economic activity like Francis Fukuyama said. So yes, ethics can be profitable. But, and that is my claim, there are two things fundamentally wrong with this. First, ethics cannot be outsourced by the leadership of a company, not to the best consultant in the world, not to your most excellent subordinates, and surely not to a PR company. Integrity cannot be bought. Our one cannot shift moral responsibility because it is essentially also about leadership. I serve on a sustainability advisory board of a Belgian bank and it only functions well because both the CEO and the president of the board are personally involved. One cannot shift moral responsibility because it has to be alive in each and every working place within the company. There is no such thing as small unethical choices. Ethics are contagious. And the second thing that is wrong with this idea of ethics, ethics as a tool for prospering business is that ethics should not be instrumentalized. Even when stretching the time scale to its utmost and being extremely patient in harvesting the much-awaited sweet fruits of integrity. Why is that? Because they're simply will be times when doing what's right is going to cost money and continue to cost money. We should not forget that somewhat uncomfortable message of Immanuel Kant, that is, that doing the right thing is about doing it for the sake of it being the good thing to do and not for any other reason. 
<laughs> now, if integrity cannot be outsourced, and if it should not be instrumentalized, the question, of course, is, can it be regulated? That's a very tough question, and I will go into that. But if regulation only creates a culture of formal compliance, mm -hmm. forgetting about the two objections I just mentioned, then it is to be feared that the fundamental question concerning ethical behavior, is it right, will continue to be trumped by two other rather practical questions. Is it legal and is it profitable? Coming back to Kant again, Immanuel Kant's categorical imperative tells you to only act in a way whereby you can wish that your behavior should become a universal law for everybody. But that is not the same as what some people make of it. Act in a way whereby you can see that your behavior corresponds with everybody else's behavior. The law of the great numbers is not an ethical law. Warren Buffet once said, the five most dangerous words in business are everyone else is doing it. Not only are these five words dangerous and bad business, they also provide for an ethical slippery slope. Let me now address the crucially important question of regulation. I will need to come back to the theme of morality at the end of my speech, but it would be foolish not to establish the fact that regulation is all important in providing for minimal standards. These can ensure the indispensable trust in the sector that non-compliance with these standards will by no means give a competitive advantage to those who do not, who do not abide by the rules. Still, I want to point out that there are some drawbacks. First, of course, there is the annoying red tape, administrative complications, and the transaction cost of compliance and enforcement is important and very often underestimated. That's, that is not a very original thought, and I will not go any further into that. It is true, life would be easier if we were all angels incapable of sinning. But second, and I will elaborate on this second problem, there is a real danger of an ethical substitution effect. Let me tell you about a field study by the Israeli Institute of Technology in 1998, presented under the title, A Fine is a Price. I think it was conducted in collaboration with the Dutch Tilburg Universiteit. In a group of daycare centers for children, a monetary fine for late-coming parents was introduced. Indeed, parents picking up their children after closing time, yet yeah, they're forcing personnel to, to stay late. So what happened in, these, in this group of uh, daycare centers was a fine was introduced for those parents who came late. Well, after the introduction of the fine, the number of late-coming parents increased significantly. Significantly. You're surprised? I was also when I first saw the results of this study. The number of late coming parents increased. The theory behind this is that the parties evaluate this as a social contract being completed by establishing a scheme of fines. Now they know what the price of such behavior is and they feel that the fine compensates for the bother that they provoke in the daycare center. Now they think it's up to the management over there to compensate the crew for having to work late, instead of feeling responsible personally. The third drawback on which I would like to share a few thoughts is the bigger thy neighbor dilemma, uh, the problem of regulatory competition between nation states. The globalization and economic and financial liberalization has put tremendous pressure on the so-called Rheinland model, the socially and ecologically corrected market economy, because this model heavily relies on governments that are willing and able to impose these corrections. Harvard professor Danny Roderick, known I think from uh, his latest uh, The Globalization Paradox, and whom I had the pleasure to meet a few years ago, Roderick claims that between economic globalization 
democracy and the survival of nation states, something is going to have to give. They, can, they cannot all three continue to exist. That's a rather uh, uh, big claim. You cannot have and economic globalization and democracy and national states. I seriously doubt if the answer to our problems is to cut back on globalization, the first corner in Roderick's triangle. Protectionism and newly found or perhaps never abandoned mercantilism inevitably hurts progress also for the poorest. Worldwide connectivity might be intimidating as previously local problems have today grown into global challenges of an Olympic size, but the idea of retrenching behind national borders is not only an illusion at this point in history, I'm also convinced that it would be contrary to humankind's vocation of realizing true universality. So, segmentation of the financial markets is not the way to achieve better results. Although there is an important caveat, and this is important, I think, for European ears. Outside the European Union, most businesses and even public authorities finance their cash needs through capital markets in the first place, and only in subsidiary degree through financial institutions. And in Europe, it's the other way around. Not taking that difference into account would be an extremely naive step on behalf of European politicians. Then there's the second corner in Roderick's triangle. I'm confident that nobody in this Senate hall would like me to explore the possibility of compromising on democracy. So let's forget about hampering uh, democracy. So you have globalization, you have democracy, then let's have a look at the third corner. Our good old, well, not that old, nation state. If they are there to stay, and I think they might be more tenacious than expected, the nation states will most certainly go through an important transformation process that will severely impact our understanding of the word sovereignty. Like United States President Barack Obama said in a speech to the General Assembly of the UN, no country is big enough to solve today's problems on its own. But no country is that small that it is not part of the solution. Now the tragedy, and one might call it the tragedy of the commons, a concept first described almost half a century ago in 1968 by biologist Garrett, Garrett Hardin. The tragedy, the tragedy is that not one single actor, not one country, is willing to make the sacrifices or to limit its behavior just for the sake of the common global good. The economic game theory explains how countries get caught up in a prisoner's dilemma based on a seemingly rational expectation process concerning the behavior of the other partners in the game. And this probably explains why there were almost not enough EU countries willing to support German Finance Minister Wolfgang Schauble's proposal on the FTT, the Financial Transaction Tax. So this country, there is considerable hesitation to participate in the EU's formula of enhanced cooperation allowing some member states to proceed while others do not join, since most seem to think that FTT can only be a good idea if everybody goes along. This might be true, but waiting for everybody will most likely be pretty much like waiting for Godot. The Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace produced an interesting document in 2011 towards reforming the international financial and monetary systems in the context of global public authority. And it proposes the creation of a world public authority, but it also insists on the need for subsidiarity. I think that solving free rider problems will continue to be about international agreement, through which signatory states effectively bind themselves. And further progress in terms of accountability and stronger enforcement of freely accepted commitments is probably the most realistic way forward. Our planet needs a kind of transactional sovereignty or contractualization of sovereignties, if you wish. Now, European Union member countries are following an interesting hybrid path. 
combining intergovernmental cooperation and EU integration. Several undertakings like the creation of a banking union, assuring stricter coherence in economic and fiscal policy, the gradual improvement in the fight against tax evasion, they all stand to prove that there is no such thing as a one-size-all-fits solution. My final thought in this introductory speech goes exactly to the European integration process. After World War II, the initial engine of the peace process, in integrating economies and financial markets, this, this engine seems to have completely taken over from the more value-inspired project of peace in a more united Europe. The engine became the project. For some, the European Union is a market, rather than having a market. Needless to say, I do not share this view. I think it is of crucial importance that we continue to say that Europe has a market and avoid saying that it is a market. But I am convinced that the European future will be constructed in an even more hybrid, asymmetrical and less linear way than we have considered up till now. I understand the allergies against an Europe à la carte. I understand that. But I think it is unavoidable that different nations will find themselves at different levels of integration. One can only hope that in the heart of this Europe there will be enough room for Weber's Wert Rationalität. This has to do with how we educate our children, how we involve our civil society, how we respect the human sense of religion, how we cherish our intellectual, artistic, literary and philosophical community, and how we define sound politics. All of these things have to do with a sense of morality, character and the capacity to be critical of oneself. If we want to really live together, we best make these choices together. I thank you for your kind attention.